Hey, you're listening to the Alt Show with Elias Whitfield. Wait, that's what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, crazy. Be a, a little more excited about that. Yeah, but I don't care. Yeah, you don't want to care. <laughs> 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 yeah, like, go somewhere else because this f- sucks. Hey, this is the Alt Show with Elias Whitfield. You may have heard that last week I was hosting on 1027 The Peak for a couple of days. I was doing the graveyard shift. That's from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. It was crazy. I was basically sleeping in the middle of the day, but I got to learn a lot and just huge shout out to The Peak for allowing me to do that. But I was able to not only localize and talk about some good contests we had going on, but I also was able to talk about band facts, which as you know, I love to talk about. So let's learn a thing or two about some of your favorite alternative rock bands. It's The Elt Show with me, Elias Whitfield. Here's an Elias music fact on 1027 Peak. So the Red Hot Chili Peppers might be one of the biggest bands to ever come out, but do you know that they're actually so popular that even the Dalai Lama is a fan? In lead singer Anthony Kiedis' autobiography, Scar Tissue, he explains how he went to go visit the Dalai Lama, which is not just something you go and do. People wait ages and ages and ages to even get a minute with the man. But when walking into his temple, the religious figure expressed his love towards Kiedis' band, even allowed him to sit in on a lecture. Kiedis did so, and it wasn't until later he actually realized that it wasn't just any old class, it was one for experienced monks who had waited years and years to train with the Dalai Lama. I guess you uh, can cut the line when you're a rock star. Here's Californication, it's on 1027 The Peak. Did you know that on this day in 1996, the Smashing Pumpkins drummer Jimmy Chamberlain was charged with drug possession after the death of the band's keyboardist in his New York hotel room? This was an event that ultimately caused lead singer Billy Corgan to kick Chamberlain out of the band, an action that would end up causing the downfall of the band as the songwriting process was majorly influenced by Corgan and Chamberlain's chemistry in the studio. It wasn't until the band got back together in the mid-2000s that Chamberlain finally rejoined the band, and thank goodness he did, because he's a heck of a drummer. Smashing Pumpkins, it's today on Vancouver's It's an Elias music fact, 1027, big. Wow. After the breakup of his former band, Caius, in 1995, a young musician by the name of Joshua Hami joined several touring bands such as The Screaming Trees, Earthlings, and even Soundgarden. This was all before starting his very own new band in 1997 with some of his ex-Caius band members. The band originally went by the name of Gamma Ray, for being sued by a German metal band of the same name, it was then they decided to switch their name to Queens of the Stone Age, which ultimately was a play on drag queens. Who knew that uh, the dude from Queens of the Stone Age played in Soundgarden? Pretty cool. No one knows. It's Queens of the Stone Age, in Vancouver's modern rock. So North America got their first chance to listen to British rock stars Muse back in 2004 with the release of their third album, Absolution, but the band had been around long, long before that, actually 1994 to be exact, when they were given a grant by none other than the royal family. Yeah, Prince Charles's charity, the Prince's Trust, gave them 250 pounds, which they would use on a PA system that is still around with the band nowadays. They bring it out occasionally for weddings and in an interview with Dominic Howard, he said once, I guess you could say we owe Prince Charles 250 pounds. Hmm, interesting. Here's Muse with Uprising on Vancouver's Modern Rock. It's an Elias music fact, 1027, the big. One of the most famous songs ever to come out of England's Britpop scene has to be Verve's Bittersweet Symphony. I mean, you still hear it at least once a day on the radio. But did you know that the band actually made almost nothing off of the song? So you remember that famous strings riff that starts at the beginning of the song and ends up being in the background for most of it? Well, that actually comes from a Rolling Stones song called Last Time. The band originally had permission from Deka Records to use this snippet, but they didn't realize they also had to get permission from the publisher. And who had the publishing rights? Alan Klein, one of the most notorious managers in all of rock and roll. He actually managed the Stones, of course, and he also managed, well, the Beatles. 
The band offered Klein 15% of the publishing to obtain the rights, but Klein turned it down flat, saying, well, you guys have a hit record. I want 100%. In the end, lead singer Richard Ashcroft only received $1,000 for writing the lyrics. I almost got hurt. Wow. If you've ever paid close attention to Weezer, well, you might remember that after the release of their second album, Pinkerton, their bassist Matt Sharp separated from the band. When he was asked about his departure, he said, quote, I don't really know how to speak on this because I don't know what I should keep private and what I should share. I certainly have my views on it, as I'm sure everybody else has their sort of foggy things. When you have a group that doesn't communicate, you're going to have a whole lot of different stories. Well, great, man. That doesn't really explain a lot to us. Well, when you dig a little bit deeper, though, you find out as many great bands, they had money issues. Even went as far as to file a lawsuit against the other members of the band over the royalties for the Blue Album and Pinkerton. Yikes. This is one off their first record. It's Buddy Holly on Vancouver's Modern Rock. It's an Elias Music Fact, 1027, The Peak. So Florence Welsh of Florence and the Machine is best known for her large, sprawling sound and orchestral background music. But did you know she actually once covered the entirety of Green Day's album Nimrod? It was back in 2007 when she was working with Dev Hines of Lightning Speed Champion. It's hard to find the full album, but if you ever look online, you can find some of the snippets of the best pop punk covers ever done. Here's her new one, It's Hunger by Florence and the Machine on Vancouver's Modern Rock. Now, most modern rock fans are familiar with Canadian collective Arcade Fire's Grammy award-winning album, The Suburbs. But did you know the band was actually so dedicated to getting the purest analog sound for the album that they insisted on recording the whole album on a 24-track tape machine that ran through a 1940s mixing board? The thing was so ancient that it actually ran on vacuum tubes. They then pressed the songs onto 12-inch vinyls before playing them back on CD recorders, making the final digital versions. Now, man, that's some real dedication. Wow. So, 21 Pilots, did you know their name actually comes from play? Well, lead singer Tyler Joseph was back studying in university. He was reading a play called All My Sons by Arthur Miller, which is about a man who decides to send out faulty airplane parts to the United States military. That's for the good of his own family, but it results in the death of 21 airplane pilots during World War II. He liked the idea of it and went, oh, let's name the band this, which was a lot better than the other names they had, which were Bicycle Thief and Chill Coat. Yeah, I think they went with the good name. Here's Tear in My Heart. It's on Vancouver's Modern Rock. Singer-songwriter Beck is no stranger to fame, but did you know his mother actually shares an act for the arts as well? She was a part of the New York Andy Warhol factory art scene in the 1960s and even appeared in some of Warhol's short films. Beck wasn't aware of his mother's bohemian past till the age of 14 when he was listening to the Velvet Underground and his mom said, Oh yeah, Lou Reed? Oh, I remember meeting him way back in the day. Yes, uh, talent runs in the family. Here's back where it's at. It's on Vancouver's Modern Rock. Well, I hope you learned a thing or two. You can always head to EliasWhitfield.com for all the information about me. Uh, I release my song of the day, my music facts, uh, the alt show. You can get it first there all the time. And also, I'm trying to do a behind the story kind of thing, so you can check that out. Plus, I'm uh, hoping to change up the alt show in the next little bit, but I don't quite know when that's going to happen because I'll be honest, I'm still in the process of trying to get a full-time radio gig. Um, but yeah, more to come. Stay tuned and remember, it's all about the music, the history, and all the bits in between. Until next time, my friend. <laughs>